Great. Uh, so uh, if, since we're starting here, uh, can I invite Yong Chia, if he's around, to come join me? Uh, and Mingwa, do you Mingwa, do you want to come on board too? I know you're a frequent collaborator. What's your sense? Should Mingwa come up as well? Uh, I to think join Mingwa, us in the conversation? Mingwa is recording. <laughs> okay, all right then. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna try to keep it as casual as possible, right? Uh, mm. and standing in front of your work. Uh, do you wanna give us an introduction and walk us through what we're seeing here? Okay. How do we navigate through, you know, all these, you know, such a rich uh, imagery that we have in front of us. All right, uh, I take off my mask first. Yeah. Uh, I, actually, today I brought souvenirs for everybody. Ooh. Uh, please have one. Uh, maybe you can pass around. Yeah, just uh, take one each. So what, well, what, are, what is the thing that you're passing around? Yeah, uh, it, these are batik, Malaysian batik. But if you look at them properly, uh, they are not real batik. Because, um, uh, and, and why I'm giving this souvenir away is because um, this is also how I started to think about uh, making this work. Um, because Malaysia, um, Bate is so much uh, part of like, our national identity, like uh, in parliament, every Thursday of a parliamentary session, the MPs um, can wear Bate um, for the sessions. So do, they, it is, do they wear Bate? I don't know, okay. but uh, they're allowed to. Okay, uh, I see. Uh, uh. Um, so it, but it has a very national um, association. Um, and, um, but if you look at Bate, what is Malaysian Bate? Um, and uh, a few years back, uh, I came to this gallery uh, for the um, Love Me in My Love Me uh, for. Love, uh, love, me, love me in My Bate. Uh, for the, for the Bate exhibition in Ilham Gary, and um, suddenly there was a spark. Um, I remembered when I was younger, um, there used to be a lot of uh, Bate artworks in Malaysia. Um, Bate paintings that are made um, by, by a few artists um, around that time. Um, but then suddenly, um, slowly, this trend, um, um, a lot of contemporary Malaysian artists, modern Malaysian artists, are not using batik anymore and then slowly it becomes like a craft and, and you can only see um, this kind of um, paintings uh, normally at uh, Pasar Seni. Um, so then I was... So um, the exhibition at Ilham sparked suddenly a remembrance in me of um, that kind of uh, artworks in Malaysia. And I suddenly thought, I, I started to think, uh, just random thoughts come and go, random feelings come and go. Like, why was there um, such a kind of art form at that point in time? And then I thought maybe it is because um, at that time, um, when those artists who were making the Bate paintings, it was around the time of uh, Badeka, uh, before and after. So, um, and the images they were depicting were uh, workers um, living harmon in harmony with nature. Um, they, were, they were doing some labor work, but they're happy. Uh, maybe they're pl plucking, plucking fruits or, or they're, they're uh, fishing, uh, fishermen or the fishing village. Um, so that was the impression they wanted to give. Uh, at least that is my understanding of it, of um, what Malaysia is, harmony with nature, uh, working hard, um, and, and then everything is okay. Um, and then, so I started researching a lot in, on the internet, and then one of the quotes that frequently comes out is um, that Malaysian bate um, forbids uh, human and animal imageries because uh, Islam forbids such idolization. Um, however, butterfly is a common exception. Um, and this quote I saw um, in many websites, they just cut and paste again and again. So from there, I started to think, okay, then um, when I wanted to do, do Bate, I wanted to, to have it to do with something with Malaysian identity and uh, motifs, uh, plant motifs. Then I started to think, what uh, plant motifs that are very Malaysian, but it's not normally what we associated with, what we associate with the Bate uh, in our common practice. Then I thought, 
plantations. Um, and rubber plantation is, is one of the main uh, uh, industry uh, in, in Malaysia. It was so important that um, rubber was once, uh, Malaysia was once the biggest exporter of natural latex in the world. Um, Maybe you can start by helping us to understand what's going on here in your picture, yeah. right? Uh, so, are we seeing a plantation here? Y yeah, in a, in a way, it is, uh, it, I'm, I'm trying to make a plantation because uh, there are um, uh, four levels and, and, and rows of um, people who are stationary and then they look like they are plants, they are rubber trees and then they are also humans. And then uh, for the men especially, they look like they are wearing sarong. Uh, which, is, which also looks like the, the grooves on the, the, the rubber plant. Uh, because sarong was once also something that is very important for Malaysians. Like when you go to <coughs> picnic, you usually bring a sarong. Or you, even when you go to hospital when you're sick, you always bring a sarong. Um, if you want to change clothes or you, if, you cold, if you feel cold on, on the bed in the hospital. So it was once a very essential item, a norm, everyday item that um, is used, um, but now not so much anymore. So, so with this kind of ideas, I, 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 I um, created this uh, image. It's interesting that you mentioned that the historical batik works that you were used to seeing in the from the 1950s, uh, it normally tends to you know, show Malaysians or the people being in harmony with nature, right? Uh, but uh, in your depiction of what's going on in the rubber plantation, they don't, they don't seem entirely happy. Uh, 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 so what, what is going on then? What are you trying to uh, you know, explore? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I was also thinking, thinking the same thing. Why, why, are, why are the people working um, uh, hard labour? So harmonious uh, on the pre previous artists uh, or the previous batik paintings of, of the pre previous artists. Um, one of the reason is because um, they look at labor. They look at uh, from from a kind of very maybe sentimental or maybe romantic point of view. Um, whereas there is a, a large segment of Malaysians who worked as rubber tappers. Uh, their stories are not told. Um, I, I'm not saying that I'm trying to tell their stories, but I'm just saying that I want to highlight that there are a large part of Malaysians who, who actually built up this country uh, under very harsh circumstances um, in, in some cases. What made you become aware of their existence or the fact that their story or their memory of their, their, their labour exists? How did you first come across uh, uh, them? Yeah, I think there are several parts, like one was the show at Ilham. Um, another one was um, recently, um, um, I, 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 I'm born in KL, but now I moved to a small town uh, in Tangkak Johor. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this has to do with um, not wanting to, to stay in a big city anymore. And then uh, moving to Tangkak was just um, something of a coincidence <clears throat> and something of a reaction to, to the pandemic, something like that. Um, I'm still trying to understand why actually I moved there, but it has something to do with that. But when I was in Tangka, um, <clears throat> this is a relatively um, active small town, which once used to be plantations. So um, the house that I rented now um, <clears throat> was part of a plantation before, and I can still see plantations around. So like, um, once I can imagine once um, the place that I'm staying in was, before that was uh, all rubber plantations and maybe it became um, palm oil plantations and now it has become residential areas. So, so I'm more um, conscious of um, yeah, the, how, how this thing changes. Were there neighbours that you have come across who remember the history of that area as a rubber plantation, but was that also how you gradually came to know about the history of that particular uh, place? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually um, most of them I think um, have memories of uh, working, in, working in rubber plantations, so, <clears throat> um, either in estates or, or 
uh, small ho small holders they which they own their own land, and also the children of these um, small holders they also remember very 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 clearly and and um, uh, that they have to wake up maybe at five in the morning and then wrap themselves all up uh, to prevent mosquito bites, and then just uh, help their parents pick up um, the latex from the uh, rubber bowl. Uh. And then um, the one thing that strikes me the most is they always remember the stench of the rubber tree, the stench of latex. Uh, like, I don't have that, me that memory because my, my background, my family are, are not rubber tappers, so I don't have that part. But they have that, that memory, is the, the smell memory is so much imbued, um, Emb embedded in their, in their brains and I think that was very interesting. Uh, there was something, there's a memory that I have no access to but it's so prevalent in them. Right. right. Yeah. But they were, the, that's the first thing that they told you and were you trying to capture uh, some part of that sensation in your work? How, what's the process of you know, trying to merge your interest in Bate in, mm. uh, with your interest in the local history? Uh, I think uh, for me there were two challenges. We, one is um, trying to make batik and the other is trying to make sense of the subject matter uh, uh, of the rubber trees, the rubber planters and Malaysian history in relation to that. Um, because um, I, I think batik is a very hard material to work with because you have to work with uh, wax uh, and colour and the colour has to stay onto the cloth um, um, maybe a little bit of um, example is uh, okay. Maybe the Union Jack flag. Okay. Um, if you have yellow, if you put yellow first, you can never put uh, blue onto the area that has yellow. You put blue on the yellow, it will always become green. If you put brown onto yellow, it will become uh, orange. Uh, so you have to plan ahead. Uh, so for each step, uh, the, the, the areas that has to stay blue, no yellow can touch that area. And, and once uh, after you have um, put the color there, you have to soak it in the chemical uh, uh, to raise the alkali level and then wait for another day. Uh, then wash, rinse it out and uh, apply another color. And, and apply another uh, layer of uh, wax. So, so you have to do s many steps um, in order to, to achieve uh, different um, layers of colors. Uh. But, and then the problem is you cannot really see the exact result after you've, you've uh, painted on top of it because you still have to rinse it and you still have to remove the wax. So you never really know uh, what's the final uh, result until you uh, until it's finished? Yeah, and at the same time, also I was also trying to sometimes emulate um, the old batik painters, um, especially Chua Ting Ting. Um, but I can't. I I I I, I was because because because. Um, he, he is a very skilled batik painter. I'm, I just started two years ago. Um, but what were you trying to emulate? Were there specific features or details that you were interested to Yeah, know, for capture? example, the crackling technique. This, this is where um, you put layers of wax uh, when they are um, still liquid form, uh, and then you squash it. So these cracks are, are the, the places where the cracks of the wax happen and the, and the paint seeped into it. Um, but I felt that, um, and, and sometimes when you look at bate paintings, you always think of the crackling effect. And, and then oh, you, when you see bate, you always say, okay, it has to have crackling effect sometimes when you, when you think of bate. Um, but I don't like to do it artificially. I like, I like it to happen um, organically. Um, um, so, but I, I sometimes I feel like I need to to make the crackling effect in order for it to look like Malaysian batik. Um, so, um, in a way, I, I resolve this, uh, especially in this piece, um, by making the crackling um, consciously, um, and it comes out like 
barbed wires. And that, because it looks like barbed wires, I can make it into a story of um, um, the new villages. Uh, at that time, they were... Um, Tangka was a new village. Tang, there, there are two new villages in Tangka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not entirely. Uh, there are also some areas which are not, not new villages. So maybe, uh, what do you hope to sort of like convey through the work in, in, in considering like the laborious technical process that you have learned and also your investment and interest in this local history, bringing them together, what are you hoping to tell you know, uh, a gallery visitor who's looking at your work? Oh, what is this? Yeah. Um, I, for me, I, I, ha I, I don't know what I want to tell to visitors. Um, for me, the process is more for myself, of my trying to understand, for me to try to understand um, maybe what Bate is as a material, as a national identity, and part of Malaysian history, um, like plantation history, uh, rubber history in Malaysia. Um, and so that it helps me understand what Malaysia is and what I am, because I'm also part of, part of this, this thing. Yeah, I, whenever I do work, I just hope, uh, I don't think of the audience when, when, when I do work. I, I'm just like, I'm so obsessed with trying to being, uh, being uh, um, attracted to these ideas and, and a lot of questions that come up. I, I, I just try to find out for myself uh, through the process of, of making works. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, uh, thank you. So thank you. Thanks, Yongchia. Uh, let's move on to our next uh, artist. Uh, Dipali, are you here? OK, great. Uh, do you want to lead us to your work? Since we're going to be doing a bit of active walking. Yes, let's do that. OK, uh, Dipali. Uh, maybe we can start with helping us, you helping us to understand what is going on here and what are we seeing. Uh, OK. Um, yeah, hi, good morning. Thank you so much for making the time to come today, uh, especially on a Saturday morning. And uh, thank you to Ilham Gallery and the team here for giving us artists an opportunity to put up an experiment with new works. Uh, okay, starting off with this work. My work is titled Membawang, which means gossip. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, what I was trying to do with this work is trying to bring to the four stories about women, okay, about the small little things that we experience in our daily lives, which all, most of the times we just tend to brush off and think that, oh, this is okay, you know, but then it has this lingering feeling that, yeah, something was not right about it, but you don't know what was not right about it. And you try to find out, you know, what it is and most of the times you just forget about it and then you perform the same actions again and you realize that yes something was not right about it but you're still doing it so it's so it's those little little things that I've picked up uh, and converted the whole thing into a montage slash collage of um, so of sorts there are three components to your work. Yes, there okay. are three components. So this is one screen. Yes. And then we are going also going to see another screen late uh, as uh, we walk you can, into the or gallery. We can just have the talk here. But okay. So there are three components to the, the thing. Uh, it goes back to the theoretical idea of gossip, which is, which is considered to be a bad thing. You know, I mean, when I was growing up and uh, if I had friends, and boys as friends who would say, ah, you girls just sit and gossip around. And I really did not want to be part of that because I felt like this was such a bad thing. But I feel today I've lost out on a lot by not being part of it because uh, while you are gossiping, you know, it's like a double-edged sword. Uh, you, why is this thing throw, giving a throwback? Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's okay. probably not, the, yeah. yeah. So it's like a double-edged sword where you, uh, yes, while you're talking about things and people, but at the same time, you're also building solidarity. Okay. So if I were to go back to the historical connotation of gossips, uh, it, it was not, it was a way of transmitting knowledge amongst women, of uh, passing on knowledge, creating a collective truth and, you know, standing for solidarity. 
and till the witch hunts, it was a very common practice to be sitting in a tavern and drinking and talking, which nowadays we call girls' night out <laughs> kind of a thing, right? So that's such an interesting idea. Uh, how how do you, how are you translating that in your into in, your work? What into, are we seeing yeah. here that gives us a sense of that bridge? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Idea so, that you have just shared with us. So uh, what I do is I I pick up topics or themes which usually are difficult to talk about, uh, or like I said, the small things. Like one of the videos in the uh, um, so there are three screens. One screen is here. One is inside the gallery, and one is at the gift shop. And all three have different stories. And one of the stories over there is about this. Uh, old lady and you know talking to her husband and she's telling telling her husband that yes I have compromised and he's like uh, how have you compromised I, I never asked you to compromise because the husband feels that he's a very understanding husband okay so he's like I never asked you to do it and then she says you don't have to tell me uh, to do it because the world tells me to do it my mom told me to do it okay and my mom's mom told me to do it. So it's about these behaviors that we kind of carry on uh, and practice without, uh, you know, without thinking or without giving it a thought that why it is like this. So that's 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 one of the stories there. the The screen over here shows uh, uh, is is a story about a cyborg housewife. So when I was making this work, I was. Um, uh, the theme of the cyborg is a very constant theme in all my artworks about being in a sum assemblage with uh, of a human and a machine and especially its connotations to cyber feminism so um, these these topics are very interesting and when you talk about cyber feminism and you talk about being a cyborg uh, all of us are cyborgs to some extent but i was trying to bring the image of a normal housewife into a cyborgic uh, role, and uh, and and I was trying to find out through my research how how what makes a housewife a simple housewife a cyborg, and so the answers are in the in the work. Over so here. these were these are images. Uh, these are. Uh, 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 clips, clips yes. taken from the internet and uh, yeah. uh, of it's, movies yes. and so yeah. So the, yeah. the genre that one would put this into is uh, found footage or the whole less significant genre of the poor image. Uh, and this is uh, um, my introduction to poor image is only from Hito Stirl's, um essay in defense of the poor image. Can you tell uh, us a bit more what the poor yeah, image is? So the yeah. poor image is all about, uh, uh, you know, you make copies. Like today, it's very common, you know, to, to make copies of things that you see. It's not about having uh, very sleek, high resolution uh, videos, okay? While actually it's, it's both. Uh, but most of the times when you tend to take a photo, you know, you're not framing it. You're not thinking about framing. You're not thinking about anything. You're just taking a picture because you want, you want to use it to send it to somebody or something like that. And uh, sometimes you like something on, on TV, which is what I do. Uh, during the lockdown, uh, I was really isolated. And uh, I, I, I was trying to find solidarity amongst, you know, because I was not able to meet anybody. So, how, so I was trying to find solidarity through the media that I was consuming. And so anything that I liked, I would just create a video bank, a bank of moving images on my phone. And then afterwards, I just picked them out and, and stitched them together. Uh, so the reason I use the poor image for this, uh, for this artwork is because um, it is, it's a less significant genre, means like uh, a high resolution image is very uh, connoting masculinity, okay? Everything sleek, proper, perfect, perfect, okay? While this is like imperfect, it's joined, it's stitched, it's overlapping, uh, but at the same time, it has its own economy and its own um, circulation. So how is the sleek, uh, high resolution image uh, how, how do you sort of associate that with masculinity? Is it because uh, of... Yeah, because uh, 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 the standards that have been uh, portrayed about what an image should be, mm -hmm. okay, comes from a very uh, male, male gaze point of, point of view. 
and uh, uh, what I'm trying to do is trying to bring it to a female gaze point of view uh, and also male gaze has been defined for the past hundred years you know so there is a certain way in which uh, men look at objects and images or create objects and images. So for example, what's going on here is you're seeing a, a, a television showing yes. maybe a film by a male director, yes. done by a male director, maybe objectifying the women, but right. we're also but, seeing it through but, your but, lens. Yeah, so you're, there are three eyes to it. Yeah. One is what the director must have shot. Uh -huh. One is how, uh, you know, uh, I or, or the audience looks at it. Okay. And one is how I record it. Okay. and for the purpose that I'm recording it for. So, so that's, I mean, trying to break the male gaze. Right, uh, okay, thing. okay, okay. Um, yeah. When you say break the male gaze, uh, then you're bringing your own subjective interpretation by stitching together yes, images that yes. we don't normally like, yeah. so see I, together? I don't that... know if everybody feels it, but every time I look at, the, look at some of the stories, it just feels like, okay, yeah, this really makes sense. There are lots of aspects about this work which sometimes might be a little far-fetched for uh, you know, the other to understand. But uh, at the same time, I think if you make an effort, you know, uh, you can get it. No, no, yeah, yeah. But that's where interpersonal yeah. interpretation yes. comes, becomes yeah, such yeah. a rich yeah. uh, area to think about, right? Yeah, because yeah. each of us will have our own individual, own, own individual yeah. interpretations. Yes, right. okay, that's, cool, that's cool, true. Cool. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so and also, um, if you look at all the stories that are there, um, they are all uh, trying to match the, the critical feminist theories that, that, that we, you know, it, it's basically a way of finding language mm -hmm. to put these things out in a, in a very simplistic way so that everybody understands. Because if you go to read uh, feminist theories, okay, they can be very complicated and, you know, to some extent, you know, you're like, uh, yeah, it takes a long time. But uh, what I was trying to do was, how can I bring these theories into practice uh, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis level, you know? So they're mostly examples, like if you go to see. Uh, like if, uh, if I were to talk about, let's say, Audrey Lord's, uh, it, uh, uh, this whole idea about the erotic, mm -hmm. okay, then that Makyong video is what I'm trying to translate into uh, uh, a, a little bit of a loser way to kind of understand it. But without reading the difficult to access theory, mm -hmm. can a visitor, can a viewer yes, of yes, your of work course. still access and yes. understand yes. what yes. you are trying to communicate? So. Okay. I hope so. Yeah? Uh, I hope so. Uh, yeah. But I think what maybe is uh, so successful is not so much the image, uh, what the content is about, right? It's how you have bring together, bring, it uh, together. bring everything together, uh, especially in your reference of this idea of the poor, poor image, image, right? When you're stitching things together, uh, we normally think of video editing as this very smooth, smooth process yes, where yes. you uh, bring different things and yeah. it high, that produces yeah. a, a, work, yeah. uh, a, a video that is of high production value. Right. But in using the word stitching, yeah. you are using a, very, a, a word that references a very different type of economy. Right. Uh, you know, of women hand. at home, yeah, yeah. using the hand, hand, using your hand, it's a more yeah. labor yeah. And intensive. And is, is that what yes, you had in mind? And then, uh, so, I, the, so there were certain parts of the editing which I wanted in a particular way and I was not able to do it. So I tried to engage an editor to help me. And the first thing that everybody would do was try to clean up the image. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, just leave it. Don't, don't clean the image, okay. just leave it. Okay. And uh, so they would find it very, uh, because when you talk about it, like you said, about editing, you know, it's always very polished. Uh -huh. Okay, so they try to polish it and I'm like, let it just be the way it is because they, they, I think the imperfections of it uh, make it more interesting to give it a view, like putting, putting a clip of Lucy uh, next to a Makyong clip is like, you know, you're like, what are these two images doing together? Okay, but in some way they are, uh, you know, kind of talking about the same things, about flow and creative energy. And right, like okay. So in choosing to bring together all these different things, in choosing imperfection over gloss, uh, uh, 
uh, in choosing to emphasize on the things that you consume and your own highly, perhaps almost idiosyncratic understanding of how images relate to one another. What does it, uh, uh, how, does it, how do you connect that to Mambawang, the act of gossiping itself? Uh, which you have chosen as the title, title of your right. right yeah. So one, one is yes, there are stories. It's like knowledge banks, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, but also there is like a connecting, like if you look at that uh, in in the images, you uh, in the videos, you will see that there is a constant image of a washing machine going round and round. So it's it's a connotation of uh, how gossips are circular. There is never a beginning or an end to it. You don't know where it has come from. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's 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 what I was, and that's how I put it as Mambavang. Uh, the second thing is um, we used very small screens, okay, and the audio is also like it's not like super loud. So you have to literally go close to listen to what it is it's like a gossip, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and uh, I selected like we tried to put them in corners. Uh, and that's the reason why it's in con. So you won't find it like, you know, on a big projection or something. It'll always be a small corner somewhere in the gallery where you, you know, the work is quietly existing. Great, wonderful. Are there any questions? I sorry, I forgot to ask if there are any questions on Yongcha's part. But are there any questions for Dipali that anyone have? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I forgot to. I have to, I have to mention one more thing. But yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, so I wanted to ask about the relationship between this work you're making and the last video work you made that you showed at Mutual Aid Projects. I, I Mutual Aid it? Projects. Oh, yeah. Yeah. okay. Which, yeah. I mean, that one was really about the kind of like anxiety of the global, cos <laughs> thank you, <laughs> cosmopolis <laughs> and like this sense of also a kind of like floating and like voyeurism, but like obviously on very distinct geographies. Yeah. Whereas this one is from what you said, like really made in the home. So I, I guess what is the relationship between the two works for you? Like how did you think differently okay. with this versus the other? So uh, of course the relationship is that they are very personal works. Uh, what I was doing with Uncertain Relaxation was trying to get over a period of isolation, okay? And uh, trying to get over a, a, a life experience that I had which uh, kind of made it, it just became easier through my, when I put it as an artwork for me to get through it. Uh, but at the same time, it's still, uh, I think the treatment is very much similar to what this is in terms of like the using the poor image, using things which I have captured on my iPhone. So I'm not, you know, putting it on a, shooting in a, on a tripod or getting like a lot of equipment to do this thing. Uh, so that's 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 one of the common things, and uh, I think the biggest common thing is different time periods of my life are actually uh, uh, embedded or like stamped onto the artworks that I have. So what I'm going through is what is what makes its way through in in the in the work. So I yeah yeah I mean does it answer your question? I don't know. You have a follow-up question. Uh, it seems like you're thinking. Yeah, tell me, tell me what you're thinking. I'd, I'd like to hear. No, I mean, I guess, you know, when you talk about, when you talk about your work, you're so theoretical about it. And yes. then there's this level of, like, personal that I think comes with a little bit more interrogation. So, yes. I mean, what's that? So, yeah, yeah. That, is, that is, I think it's a trope that I have adopted over a period of time, because when you make feminist works, uh, it's very easy for them to get lost as narcissism or, uh, you know, just, uh, just, you know, being a rebellious kind of a person when you make these works. But I feel like theory gives me the language to talk about it and to emphasize what I'm trying to say, which could otherwise be taken as frivolous and, you know, not irrelevant, which is what happens most of the times. So. Uh, I use that as a language, but there is a personal, <laughs> it's always there. But also, it starts with the personal, then I go about reading about it or trying to find out why it is the way it is, and then it lands up in a work kind of a thing. Mm, great.
Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Dipali. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a mic switch now. Uh, with oh, I, I just want to make speaker. one last point. Okay. So these works are made by, uh, not it's, it's not just my story, but these are stories and interactions which I've had with a lot of women uh, during the lockdown. And some of them are over here. Sharmin is here, Shao is here, Ellen is here. And I wanted to thank all of them for, you know, lending their ears and, and, and you know, kind of collaborating on it a bit. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, why don't you start by introducing your work? Give us a sense of what's going on and what are we looking at. All right, uh, once again, uh, thank you all of uh, everyone here today. Uh, thank you for spending a lovely Saturday morning um, with us in Ilham. Uh, thank you to Ilham as well for organizing uh, the talk. Uh, my name is Blank Malaysia, um, and this work. Uh, is actually I would, how I would describe it is a transitional piece for me um, because it was created during a time period where I myself is finding a new language as an artist. Okay, so there's actually two elements to this work. The first part being the physical part and then the second part being the projecting, projected image. Okay, so the physical element uh, first thing first is what I've been doing as an artist. I'm a self-taught artist and I've been doing uh, work for about close to 10 years. And all this while, as an artist, I've been interested with the idea of, of time. So uh, it comes from a very personal space uh, of how I see myself as an ind individual uh, living in Malaysia and how I, as a person, relate to the chronology of time unfolding as we live every day in the present. So right. how, how is this idea of time expressed in right. Your, right. your painting? Is it a painting? Right? Yes. You, you have it's a painting. painting practice before? Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's actually a painting on a canvas. Um, what I'm doing in this piece is actually uh, trying to activate uh, various ideas we have of time. Basically, when we think about something, we always imagine kind of like a linear unfolding of an event. So we always imagine a past moving to a present, moving to a future, and it's what people usually call the arrow of time. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's actually accumulation of information. So um, as a practicing artist, which have been doing this for a while, I've always been interested in the idea of entropy as well, which people always describe as a breaking down. But in a physics kind of uh, uh, way, it's actually accumulation of more information. It's becoming more complex from a simple uh, low energy to, uh, no, high energy to a more stable and more complex uh, way. So when it comes to this artwork, I'm actually trying to capture um, the textures of time. So you can actually see uh, over a period of three years, um, the original piece was actually supposed to be part of a three-part series, which started out in the 2020. Okay, so this is the first time I actually experimented with a canvas of this size. Usually my size is smaller and I make sculptural works. Um, but this is the first time I do a two meter size piece. And um, the approach is quite different. So if you look at the artwork, there's certain areas which things are removed. So there's underpainting to it. Um, so the idea behind the physical aspect of the work is it's a work which kind of like unfold, but at the same time, you don't know which comes first, right? You don't know which is the earlier part, which is the later part, which has been removed, which has been added on. So uh, this is what I always describe as textures, uh, temporal textures, and to each person when they approach the piece, they would have like a different understanding to it. Because first thing first, in this like setting, it might not be so clear, so it encouraged the person to uh, approach it from different angles and look at the various cracks which appear. So these cracks itself, um, uh, the process is controlled. Uh, I can't really know how it will turn out in the end, but I've experimented with various materials and each material would have a different effect. So by actually putting multiple layers of uh, various materials on it, you have different drying times 
therefore creating randomized effects, but in some ways, I know where it might end up. So is this your hand? Uh, is this a palm that I'm seeing or am I just yes. um, imagining so, things? Yes. Uh, okay. It right. is, it is uh, finger work. So actually, um, there's uh, maybe about five, six layers and then it's removed and then it's put on again. So certain parts you can see like traces of the human hand, but I don't want to make it so obvious in the sense where you just see a palm. But um, in some ways, you, I want to have like idea that it has been, it has gone through processes. But at the same time, uh, you can't trace which is the starting point and which is the ending point. It's a melange of uh, various actions, various things that happen. Yeah, so that's the physical part of the work. And this is an accumulation of 10 years of practice la, in yes. some ways. Like yes. The thinking behind 10 years Correct. of practice. Yeah. But and actually, this piece takes about three years to, to create it. Yeah. Yeah. And then now you're introducing a new dimension to your work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, actually, currently, I'm doing uh, my master's to get in, in, in UM, actually. And uh, as an artist, it has kind of opened up uh, new elements which I've always been interested in, but I didn't get the chance to explore it in depth till now. So, uh, more towards like historical-based research. Yeah, so um, the images that you see, there's a reason why I actually chose a projector image onto the piece and it's not projected to the entire reality of the, the, the canvas, only because I want to create like an uncomfortable juxtaposition between both images. So it's not like when you, when you come to a darkened area like this, the eye is immediately drawn to a lighter image, right? So even though the canvas might be two meters, but this is like the focal point for most people, especially when you take the corner, you know, um, and you take a look at it. And since it's moving, it continuously capture our attention. But in essence, uh, it's actually a two, two meter piece and then the image itself will change according to the pieces. Uh, right, so why did I choose these images? Um, the images is actually uh, taken from archives, actually. Um, they are public domain archives, which can be found and can be used um, and accessed by anyone who is interested. Okay, so, uh, for anyone who have been dealing with like uh, images which is taken from somewhere else, the idea of copyright always comes out. So before this, when I engage with um, artwork, it's always coming from my own um, works. So I don't have to worry about copyright. But when it comes to these works, uh, immediately you kind of like face with this idea of who owns the image, even after. Uh, you know, 100 years have moved on. Of course, after 100 years, it's in the public domain. Uh, but these images are all from various spots around uh, Malaysia and Singapore. Okay, so it's actually combined together with my own uh, personal photography, which I did. And the idea being of why I keep both of them into the same projected work is because I want to re-question or open up the question um, to the public, to the viewers of uh, what are the legacies which we have within spaces, like post-colonial spaces, like, such as Singapore or Mal Malaysia, um, and what are the stories and narration which we continue in our own lives without really questioning it. So actually in each picture, you can actually see a different element, uh, which I find to be quite interesting. And if you go back to historical records, there's a lot of connecting threads, such as um, for example, uh, if you look through, okay, so this is an interesting spot. So if you are familiar with Singapore, uh, this is actually uh, Teluk, Teluk Air, I think something. Yeah, um, so actually this water area currently is already uh, just land, it's houses, yeah. So a lot of these colonial spaces look familiar, yet it's very distant to us, but um, all of these structures have a different narrative which kind of ties it all together in the sense where uh, people would call it like a spatial way which are the colonial forces such as the British. When they came over, they have um, certain ways of projecting power onto the native landscape. So usually when people describe these areas, it's always in a very spatial kind of way 
So they describe buildings. Okay, this, this is the majestic hotel in Ipoh actually. Uh, currently, it's in the process of being renovated to be reopened. So the progress is uh, it's changing again. Yeah. Uh, so colonial spaces is usually described in a very spatial kind of way. You always describe, oh look, this is a building that is left. Um, but actually, there's also a temporal aspect which we often forget. Because um, if you think about it, Malaysia, uh, the narratives that we weave around it um, has changed quite a lot since the intervention of colonial forces. And especially in our countries, the narration continues, right? Like, um, until recently, uh, you have a lot of like uh, conversation about who and what we should recognize as part of our heritage. Like uh, in Malaysia, we start to rediscover back the idea of Nusantara and what the archipelagos around uh, the Malay archipelagos around uh, Malaysia is in connection to us. And in Singapore as well, there's a questioning of uh, you know, like for example, figures, historical figures, at Raffles, which is everywhere still. Um, but they have a very, very uh, strong uh, history which it continues till today. Yeah, so all of these spaces are when it's changed when a colonial force comes into the space and they basically impose their idea onto the terrain itself, both spatially and temporarily. temporarily. Yeah, so this image, yeah? yeah, this image is actually taken by me and the way I took it, even though I didn't realize it about 15 years ago, um, was akin to landscape shots, which, you know, people used to go, they survey the area, they find a high spot, they take a landscape. And I find myself constantly drawn to this process. Whenever I go to a new city, whether it's Rome or wherever, like I'm drawn to high areas to take like a panoramic shot. But then we never had, like question, you know, why, why we start like trying to get a bird's eye view and try to form an understanding from this supposed bird's eye view. Yeah, so this is actually Georgetown and uh, I think it's about the 1890s or something. So you can see it's actually quite quote unquote developed already. Uh, but the point of interest would be Fort Convalis. So uh, for anyone who is like uh, familiar with uh, the colonial language of uh, architecture, there's always the idea of a padang of a space which they flatten and create a square, right? So it's a very unnatural area if you think about it. For us today, Padang is just Padang, you know? But if you just think back how this idea has been naturalized, you know, um, it's actually a very British concept which originated from Calcutta and then brought over to the straight settlements and got uh, reinterpreted all the time. So if you think about it, if you reflect back on Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, um, Taiping, um, there's a central area, a parade ground, followed by civic buildings. And then around there would have like more, uh, what's it called, like a recreational area. So, yeah. So help us to understand what's going on in uh, the image, the, the montage that you have created. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you have uh, historical photographs, yes. which you use to uh, seek, uh, to show us mm -hmm. uh, different types of like colonial spaces. Yeah. and. And then you have you marry this together with photographs that you have taken right. that also uses the same photographic conventions, which I feel it might have. Yeah. Okay. Like especially in the spaces which I myself have been through, like all these spaces sometimes today, especially after like uh, we have been independent for a while, we see it as a very Malaysian space. In fact, these spaces have become tourist areas where, like for example, we go to. Uh, uh, Penang, people will talk about this as a popular tourist attraction. But these are sites which have a different connotation, different narratives, which have changed. So when you're bringing these two sets of images together, what does it, uh, what are you thinking, what, what does it got, what, yeah, what, are you, what does that make you think about? And, and why, how does that uh, push you to bring this body of work to yeah, together with like you know your earlier practice, yeah. Yeah. Um, the reason why I uh, put both of these images together is to kind of like raise these questions of um, where does the borders between these narrations and you know like how have it affected us in 
framing how we see uh, the world we live in. Like, um, to, to what extent does this narrating, uh, narration of uh, the past continue to play a role within how we see ourselves in the present as well? Um, why I actually projected this image into a different space. Um, if you think about it, it's actually two different narration which is happening at the same time. Uh, the first is my own personal work. It's a very personal piece in the way where how I approach it, how I interacted with it over a period of three years. And then this image is imposed onto this spot as well. So if you think there's again, the square, the parameters is, is there and at the same time, it's so strong, you know, it's constantly trying to overwhelm the piece, which for me, um, kind of like, again, uh, speak of the process of um, how these pasts continue to haunt us till, 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 till this. But only this part of you, yeah, not the entire part. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So each of the picture, like, for example, if you notice, this is actually Malacca. And you will see the certain structures which reoccurs again and again, such as the flag, the flag uh, stuff. Um, this is Malacca as well, which I have taken in the present. Um, actually, not present like about seven, eight years ago. But yeah, but you see, what's interesting is for me is that uh, as you are explaining your work, uh, and it helps to make clear what what your interest in uh, where your interest lies. Uh, is that. Uh, it, even with these two sets of images, uh, there's so much meaning to it, right? But you did mention at some point you're interested, uh, all of this amounts to your interest in entropy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by any definition of entropy, it is this sort of like eventual gradual slide into yeah. meaninglessness that all of these things doesn't sort of like matter at all. So why, why, where does that interest sort of like come in and how does it play out in uh, your practice? Um, when it comes to these images, um, of course, the idea of entropy is very, very large. You know, like today, uh, people don't really think about it so much because the narration is no longer so upfront because we have our own nationalistic uh, narration which is overlaid on top of it um, but once more uh, the idea of time like how does this narration change how does it evolve with given enough time and again each of this image represent like a separate narration and each of it would have a different uh, time span of how it is remembered in the public so once more I'm just trying to just touch on all of these uh, elements which uh, I don't really have an answer as of yet because this piece I would feel um, kind of like symbolize my, my own personal transition uh, not really transition but a different phase of me as an artist because this was created at the beginning of what I'm interested in right now as uh, an artist who is interested in uh, discovering more about local histories and what it has to say and what role does it continue to play within our own lives as of today. So maybe in being comfortable with even playing with these images, even if it's an unknown, it's not resolved, fully resolved, uh, has a kind of like a dimension that is entropic, is it? Yeah. So even this hill, actually, uh, today this is Raffles Place, actually. So this hill no longer exists. And if you look at the end of the video, there's another hill, which is there. It's no longer hill as well. So uh, if you wait for another few more minutes, you see a final image of like a mound. So actually this mound is a very personal space for me because I'm from uh, a small town in Penang called uh, Nibung Tabau. So I used to go towards uh, this hill. It's quite, it's not such a large hill, but I would say it's about a couple of floors up and we used to cycle down it and do all kinds of crazy stuff on it. But over the years, um, once more, uh, companies, appeared and they slowly remove uh, uh, the soil of the hill and over a period of about 10 years each time I go back home to Penang I realized the hill is becoming smaller and smaller and today it's actually just a hole in the ground with one small tiny mound which I don't know why they didn't finish mining it but from a hill even today if you go to that area they still call it Changkat, Bukit Changkat but there is no bouquet. And if you think about it, like in uh, geography wise, to 
the creation of a hill, you know, takes millions of years, you know. But humans, we intervene within like 100 years and we just change stuff so much. And because we are so stuck in the present, like we live life day by day, these changes might not seem so big, but if you just see it in a more long temporal way, like these changes are, you know, monumental. Yeah. So that's the conversations which I'm trying to have. Uh, the next image actually you can see is actually uh, a train ride uh, besides uh, Tasik, Buk Bukit Merah or something? Tasik, something like that. Like, it's in um, Perak. So even right now, there's a huge uh, like, uh, drought there. So the place are changing, ecology is changing. So there are elements of uh, you know, the grand uh, changes in time as well within the piece. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Black Malaysia. Why the name Black Malaysia? You want to? Uh, right. So actually, the, when I first started out, I did a lot of like street art as well. Okay. So the reason why I chose Black Malaysia is in response to uh, the idea in Malaysia where everything, every form that we try to fill out, there's always a category which says race. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, I just don't want to fill it for the longest time. So I just like, okay. So I just want to call myself Black actually, but yeah, uh, Malaysia, blank is taken, so I have to add Malaysia at the end. <laughs> so do we have any questions for blank Malaysia here? Go ahead. Uh, is it okay if I ask something that's a bit more theoretical? Sure, but I'm not sure if I can answer it. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, because looking at this, I thought of how it seems to constitute, like how you're interrogating different forms of memory, because there's sort of like a more physical memory where you're that's basically like the background where basically there's handprints and things that are imprinted with time. But then on top of this, you're overlaying, uh, again, images, videos, and that sort of thing. Um, in that sense, you sort of see this as interrogation of how we remember because we very much remember in terms of media and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're qu quite, quite correct there. Um, because before this, when I was creating my works, I always like to describe my works as another way of capturing or interpreting time. So when we look at artworks, usually there's a lot of narrations happening, but how I view my artwork is, in some ways, it's like a clock, right? It's an object which we compare with to decide the progression of time. So these works aren't just a work, it's actually accumulation of information. You know, like uh, the Japanese would describe it as like a patina, which developed through time as well. Um, so, within the piece, once more, you can see there's a lot of changes which happen and uh, all of these changes, in some ways, speak of a different interaction with it, somewhere in the duration of about three years. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, let's move on to a very different time scale, mm -hmm. uh, from a personal reckoning with the past to uh, something much more historical and iconic. Uh, our next person is uh, Zihao, right? Can you hear? All right. So I, I feel like I'm in a, a petro gallery petro science kegemilangan uh, Nusantara art science exhibition, mm -hmm. <laughs> where you're supposed to touch something and something's going to happen with, yeah. with a VR thing. Yeah, with a sort of like yeah virtual thing going on on the screen. So can you tell us what is this, uh, yeah, what, what is going on here and... All right, so, um, well, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, so this work is titled The Mercurial Inscription and it depicts a uh, Batu Basurat. So it's the Terengganu Inscription Stone, um, which is an artifact that was uh, believed to be dated to around 14th century and it is one of the earliest evidence of Jabi writing in Malaysia, and it heralds a new paradigm, that is the paradigm of um, Islamization in Malaysia. Uh, and it was discovered in Terengganu around the late 19th century, and due to, it was actually discovered um, because of a flood. And so, which explains why when you touch it, there is this uh, water flowing in. So whenever, what I did with this work is that when you touch this rock, which is made in aluminum, um, you will get the flood coming in and there will be a translation process happening. So the Jawi text was translated into different texts. So there's a total of 12 translations 
and 10 languages because there are only there are, there are few languages that have multiple translations. For example, there are two Malay versions, there are two English versions. So one English and Malay is actually from a translation that is provided by Terengganu State Museum. And that translation, that edition of translation is actually um, adapted from um, translations made by several colonial scholars. And uh, the other one was actually a more recent translation attempted by Ahmad Adam, a historian. So there are two translations for both Malay and English. And subsequently, I also have it translated into texts such as uh, Javanese, um, Sanskrit, Arabic, Hokkien, Mandarin, and others. So, yeah, essentially what we're seeing is something that is quite iconic, right? I think most of us here would know what the uh, Batu Basura Terengganu is all about. Yet we, I also know very little about it. Uh, to, you know, uh, what, uh, what, what is this sort of like piece here? Uh, what is the relation between this thing and what we're seeing on the screen there? Uh, it feels like the rock is also cut off. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about, you know, its discovery and what is the story behind or the, the, the whole translation process and why translation is so important to, to what you're trying to highlight here? Um, the reason I'm choosing the Batu Basurat is because I see it as a pure icon. Uh, the reason I have this idea is because of the Jawi controversy that happened in Malaysia back in 2019, right, where the government decided to introduce uh, the teaching and learning of Kat, right, um, and it caused a lot of uh, debates in Malaysia. Um, but which was quite surprising to me because we have, we have been teaching, studying Jawi uh, in high school for about several years, but people just don't know about it. We, we, we are not aware that we actually have Jawi in the textbook, um, but what the government is, was introducing back then in 2019 was just the teaching of cut as an art form, um, not knowing that Jawi has already been implemented. So what interests you about the controversy? Um, well, because I always consider it as um, there's a lot of miscommunication and that when such racialized issues have been brought up, it is very difficult to have dialogues um, because people are always um, victimizing themselves. You know, there are also Islamophobia, um, especially from the non-Muslim communities. Um, so there's this knee-jerk reaction, basically saying that the introduction of Jawi, um, the teaching and learning of Jawi represents a form of Islamization, right, which is not true. Um, but we couldn't we should also acknowledge this grievance because the, the association between the Jawi writing and Islam was in part uh, promoted by the state. That is how the state um, tends to promote Jawi writing and they see it as a kind of sacred text that cannot be um, corrupted. So the reason I'm choosing this stone is because it's pure icon, as I mentioned, and I believe that for those of us who have been through the national school, we have come across this image in the Sejarah textbook. But it is so familiar, yet it is something that we do not, we can't read it, we don't understand it. We just know it as an icon that heralds the arrival of Islam. So it's um, an icon, it's a pure icon, but we can't really read it. We don't know what is being written on it, right? What it says basically is a proclamation of Islam. So there are four sides of it. And after that, there are several commandments. Um, so it talks about some of the prohibitions, uh, what are the punishments, um, if one is in debt or one commits adultery. But nobody seems to be aware of the text, the content of it. We are just aware that this is a very important artifact and it means something to the national history. And that is precisely why I wanted to sort of uh, deconstruct this object, this artifact. It is so solid, it's so concrete, but at the same time there is so much distance between our comprehension and the object itself. And even among scholars, um, the, there is a lot of politics involved in interpreting this stone. So there are scholars like uh, historians claiming that this is dated back to the 14th century, like 1303, but subsequently it was revised saying that it was not 1303, but 1308 due to a particular specific uh, detail in the stone. And also due to the fact that this text, it is written in uh, classical Malay, old Malay. So a lot of the language that is used um, even if you understand Malay, you might not be able to comprehend it because old Malay was uh, it comprised of Javanese, Arabic, also a lot of Hindu-Buddhist texts. 
So what I find it interesting is that the very idea of Islamization or conversion into uh, another faith require, is a form of translation itself. Right? Whenever you try to convert, that um, demands that you speak the language of others. And that is what I see um, that is significant about um, translation as a form of communication and translation as um, something that is sort of like a friction. So you're, uh, if I understand correctly, are you suggesting that even though the stone is written in what we perceive to be Jawi, the very Jawi itself, uh, the very text itself, uh, when we read it and we bother to sort of like read it, uh, is drawn from different, uh, with, it carries concepts that are drawn from different cultures and it's an attempt at trying to make sense of how all these different cultures can have entered the Malay space. Yes, to some Malay extent, yes. But, okay. but that is also, um, that is how when scholars are trying to unpack what is being written, that is how we see it. We see it as a combination of different cultures, but people back then see it as just one, right? So the fact that we see it as multiple, that is an, a kind of anachronism. Um, and the, the stone right here, the shape of the stone, um, is actually coming from uh, an article that is written by Shaikh Muhammad Nakib Alatas. So he claimed that this stone is incomplete because the upper part of the stone was actually missing. Right? So this is actually a speculation of that, um, trying to recreate the upper part of the stone, yeah, the top bit. So you and can why, why is it missing? Uh, there's an interesting story behind it's, it. Isn't it's it? broken. Okay. It's broken. It's believed to be broken. Um, and we have this speculation because the text is incomplete. Once you read it from four sides, that seems to be, um, it's not complete. What is interesting about the, the challenges of interpreting this stone is also the fact that some parts of the text are missing, right? And on this side, you can see that there's a den. It was, according to local accounts, it, the stone, when it was discovered, it was used as a stepping stone um, for Muslims to wash their feet before stepping into a surau. So it's due to, again, water and the washing of the feet that creates friction that effaces the stone. So I'm playing with this idea of communication. I'm playing with the idea of translation, conversion, as a kind of friction that is slowly effacing the text. And, and, and why do you choose to um, you know, highlight the, the, the missing part of the stone and using this as a way for us to interact with what's going on? Um, uh, in your replica, in your virtual replica of the stone? I, I wanted a, a kind of, um, I wanted something that people can touch and to trigger that translation. Yeah, the reason I'm, I'm translating this stone because when something is a pure icon, it is untranslatable. Uh, to, the, to the extent that when you translate the Jawi into something else, it becomes an entirely uh, different thing. Because the readability of the text doesn't matter anymore when it's an icon. You just recognize it as an object, as an uh, iconic artifact. So translating it immediately um, changes it into something else. But you, you, you emphasize touch as a way to interact with you know, this icon. Uh, and I think in your interview or, uh, that you can find in the online resource of the Ilham, on Ilham's website, uh, you have said that this is a culturally significant practice more than sight, right? More than vision, more than how we see things. It's touch has introduces a very, uh, it's a palpable sort of like sense perception. Do you want to say more about that and how that is related to maybe specific mode of understanding or the world or uh, yeah, interacting with the world? Um, well, the, the idea of touching, first of all, comes from the idea of um, that there's, there was this account of people touching, using their feet and on stepping on it. So there's touch, that's also friction, right? When we touch it, there's always friction creating, uh, created on a stone. Um, another idea is that if you look at a lot of artifacts in the region, in Southeast Asia, uh, sacred objects are usually touched, um, especially in places like Kramats, divine um, sacred sites. Uh, because by touching sacred objects, uh, you receive uh, baroka from it. So, so like divine blessings. Baroka. Yeah. So when you when you touch it, um, it is very different from the way artifacts are being installed or museumized in contemporary setting. So today, an object is appreciated from afar. There is a glass partition. Right. The moment you see, if you 
take a look at the installation of this inscription stone in Terengganu State Museum, it is, there is a distance and you can't really touch it anymore. But in the past, when people see it as sacred, they do not put it away, they do not keep it, right? They, they kind of um, have, you still have very intimate access to this object. Like so washing is, your feet on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is in part um, what I intend to do with uh, this aluminium sculpture. Thank you. Uh, any questions from anyone? Okay, so hi. Um, you told us just now that your um, this stone, there's, they have many, like, uh, from what we see, every time we touch, it's not always Sanskrit, it's not always um, in, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I do not know what Chinese writing is called properly, but some, some are in Chinese and some are in Arabic or Jawi. Uh, for, in your point of view, is this stone related to religious, um, how do you say, from a religious point, or is it just people writing? For example, we're writing in Malay, right? But when you're writing in Malay, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're Muslim or Hindu or um, Buddhist. It's just, you know, it's a writing. But for this one, do you think it's related to religious, and are you interested in religious studies too, or is this translation for you? Um, this is definitely related to religion, right? Because of uh, the significance, at least the way it is being interpreted in the way it is being positioned in national history, it is a very religious object. Um, I, I do see that there are some ambiguities in... Jawi, Jawi is developed historically um, as a religious text, but doesn't mean that um, it, it is always affiliated with Islam. But that was, I think, the, typical, the stereotypical image that most non-Muslims who do not understand Jawi will have. So the reason I'm... The reason for this work uh, of translating um, this stone is to allow that element of uncanny that we, we, see this is, we see this as a familiar object, but at the same time, when you, if, if the text is something that you're familiar with, for example, if um, I know Chinese and I can read it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can understand it. So there's the, that was the very fundamental idea of this work, is to recognize that something familiar doesn't mean that you can actually read it. Thank you. Great. Uh, any other questions? Please. Um, uh, so like, I think um, in our past conversation, you mentioned kitsch before, and I wonder if that actually kind of played into your creation of this work, because like, you keep mentioning like icon, and um, it's a very like sort of dramatic presentation, and I wonder if like there was like any certain level of like humor or kitsch that's like uh, beneath the the work or like in your thoughts? Um, maybe in the process of translation, yes. Yeah, a little bit of it, a little bit of that. How how so? Can you um, explain? Because I think it when it is translated and you see, or maybe there's a, a text that you now can read, but when you move forward and you try to read it, you, you can't actually see it. You can't actually understand it. So is this um, play, but the work is presented in, I feel, uh, a very serious manner. Really? But I thought it borderlines ludicrousness, right? I mean, it's a, a stone that's floating in space, that's mm. that whole, yeah. your typically Malaysian futuristic sort mm. of like ambition that it's so silly mm. <laughs> on, on, some, on some level. So uh, yeah, I, I wonder if that comic dimension where you, you know, there's a long Lusantara sort of like uh, uh, a tradition where you really cut down all the tall poppies, right? And so, you, that, uh, in trying to install the work in a in a very serious way, is it also allowing the work that the allowing uh, 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 you also sort of like allowing it to uh, exist as a caricature? On yeah, some yeah. Level? To some extent, the, the, I think the fact that it is kind of floating. Um, and it is a very serious artifact, uh, at least from the state, from the perspective of the state. It, um, and now it's like floating like those you know, DVD logos <laughs> in space. <laughs> so um, I think that, it, it, that presentation, the, the aesthetic can be very different from the way state will portray um, such a serious part of our history. Cool. Any other questions? Not? Uh, yes. 
Um, I think for like uh, race or ethnicity to be to be one uh, usually has you know a culture, a language, and a script. Uh, I think like for Malay, Malay archipelago, Malay race. I think this was our script back then, but due to some cultural and historical interventions, it was gone or whatever. But where do you think is the position of Jawi now as a script in a modern, like, Malaysian present-day, you know, um, uh, you know, current setting? Where Where is the position now? Where do you think it should be? Or, you know, what's your opinion about it? Um, well, I, I can't answer that question um, because I think that the, the reason I do, I create works is because I want to open up discussions and to create, enable dialogues. Um, and I definitely see that the controversies that we have um, is preventing a lot of these dialogues from happening. So every time when we see Jawi, we immediately, um, especially the non-Muslims, will definitely just kind of uh, disregard it. Um, and it is also being heavily politicized. So nobody is attempting to understand um, what it actually is. And the media is not also very interested. They're not very interested in explaining um, the historical significance of these texts. I do think that dialogues is required. Um, and I can't really say whether we should pra be practicing it, because I feel that whatever that we have today, that is the state of um, things. That is the state of affairs of today. And I really don't want to prescribe it. But I wanted to create works that could open up discussions and space for dialogues. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dihao. And we have one more artist speaker. So uh, with that, shall we move to the other side of the gallery, uh, where Eddie Wong will present his work. OK, Eddie, this is really, really interesting to me. Uh, but I know that there's a whole backstory to it that uh, we probably need to know a bit so that we can understand what's going on. Uh, yeah, do you yeah, want to sure. start by sharing that? Yeah, yeah, I was hoping we could just have a conversation yeah. with the audience and yourself as well. Uh, so the backstory was really, um, uh, it's like my grandfather's history, really, and my family history. and. Uh, and our family's entanglement with the Malayan emergency, which I only recently found out uh, in the past two years, really. Um, so, and that has haunted me since then. Like, um, What's the emergency? Sorry, the Malayan emergency was the communist uh, insurgency in the 19, from 1948 to 1960, where, um, um, so the communist insurg insurgency entered the jungle um, to fight against the colonial British um, um, government of Malaya back then. And my f grandfather was part of the communist guerrilla um, and part of the Malaysian Communist Party member who entered jungle, one of the many thousands who ch young Chinese men who entered jungle to fight the colonial forces. And, um, and he disappeared in the jungle for five years, you know, never seen, and um, he came out as a body being dragged out um, by soldiers and displayed in front of the Tangkap police station, which is quite interesting to 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 his work there, because all it happens around Tangkap and um, uh, and the rubber estates around there as well. So, um, and all these stories was told to me um, was told to me as um, as post memories. You see, it's like other people's memories, and I'm just kind of inheriting the story, the, these stories, um, which I try to channel through my artwork. Um, yeah, and well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain about my artwork as we go along. Um, so what are we seeing here? Uh, so it's, it's pretty a, trippy. It is all very account. trippy yeah. because um, the, the model that I was, I mean, the, my practice revolves around using a lot of machine learning um, algorithms and models. Uh, it started with, it started with uh, my interest in um, computer visioning um, as a surveillance system um, from there. I was really interested in the labeling process of faces and um, body images. And so that, sort of, that practice sort of evolved into um, more like text to image generation. Because if you think about it, surveillance, AI surveillance is actually the other way around. It's, um, it's image to text. 
right? So your labor phase is, say, it's a male or female or particular race, whereas this one's a more, uh, more of a text to imaging. So uh, you use system. specific words that helps, yeah, that the computer learns to generate an image. Yes, so specific words and specific structure of sentences to sort of unlock the, um, this archives, um, the latent space, which is trained on uh, this huge amount of data set um, that amounts to billions and billions of, um, yeah, huge data sets of images and, and, and stuff owned by, I must say, owned by tech, tech companies still. You know, um, OpenAI is possibly the largest one at the moment, and Google as well. Um, they have their own data set. So it's really about tapping in, like finding the right sentence structures to tap into these archives. Um, and these archives, what are these archives? It's really like a, it's it's a it's a accumulation of co uh, the collective consciousness, right, or the collective unconsciousness, um, and yeah, by sort of tapping and summoning these images out of this archive, it's almost like um, I'm playing the role of a medium, like a spiritual medium. We're kind of summoning these images out, and and so I guess like like the work is twofold, right? First of all, it's like to of course to express my personal family history, and and second of all, it's also to destabilize the idea of the archive, mm -hmm. um, or or what was deemed like the official archives, and um, yeah. And how how does that how does that destabilization work? Uh, um, yeah, the, 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 I guess that's like the whole area of colonization that we have not talked about um, within the digital space, within AI itself. Yeah. Um, we understand post-colonialism, we understand the colonial history of Malaya, mm -hmm. uh, Malaysia. That's something more concrete. Right? There's something more concrete um, and infinitely more violent and, um, and gruesome in a way. Um, but I think a lot of the same themes are replaying over and over again um, within this digital realm, right? Um, so for example, an extraction of capital, extraction of labor. Um, so if you think about who curates these data sets for, for these huge tech corporations, they're like free laborers uh, of, of strangers, of, no, of this unknown identity. Uh, Basically entities. all of us. Like. All of us, yeah. Right. Whatever okay. we put online, whatever we share, is just this kind of gathering, this extraction of, um, of our data and, and stored in this sort of obscure um, nebulous servers, server rooms. Um, but more importantly, monetize. Yeah, definitely monetize. <laughs> um, yeah, mon yeah, so, so there are a lot of parallels to um, the colonial colonialism of the past as well, right? Um, I mean, just putting it into context of the Malayan emergency, to me personally, it's quite, um, it's all about the money, right? It's all about the economy. So when they say about winning hearts and minds, if you think about the word emergency, it was really for the insurance company in the city of London to collect, <laughs> collect insurance money, um, just because it's an emergency, not a war, right. right? But it's essentially a war, right? It's essentially a civil war or a, a revolutionary um, um, fight mm -hmm. against the colonial forces. Mm -hmm. um, so they're like, yeah, that kind of parallels that I see. Right, right. And, and so you have these tools that, um, that were developed today uh, where you can mine and tap into, say, a collective unconscious and how we dream about specific concepts and ideas. Uh, so like all acts of mediumship, you got to know the language. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the incantations. Yeah, right. the incantations. <laughs> can, you, uh, how, can you walk us through at least uh, some aspects of how you are able to learn this? incantation, the language in which these ghosts can be summoned? Yeah, that, that's a good question, really. Um, so the tool itself is quite open. Uh, I might, I mean, I'm, you know, you might have played with it already, you know, um, to, tools like Meet Journey or at least heard about it, DALI 2, uh, which is all open source online at the moment. Um, I think the secret source is really in finding the right, what they call prompts, which is the, uh, the text input itself. Um, so when I was trying this yesterday, just to get a hang of what your, uh, what your project is about, I tried putting in huge chunks of passage, like passages, the entire passages into uh, one of these software. And then it never ever read until I reduce it down to specific keywords. So is that, the, is that how you go about it? Like you have to sort of find a prompt specific keywords and that's a, th that's a thing that will help unlock 
Yeah, because the first, the first kind of natural sense that we want to do, um, we want to play with text input is really to think quite literally and usually the most simple words, right, that we can think of. Um, but it doesn't really, it's not, the intelligence isn't really intelligent. It doesn't understand the word. It understands the, 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 uh, the connections of, the, the semantic connections of that word that you use. Uh, so it's related um, concepts to that word. It doesn't really understand what an apple is, but the apple-ness of, things. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's a, apple is a, it's round, it's, it might be shiny and it's... So it's, if, you want a, uh, if you want the computer to generate an apple, mm -hmm. what are the prompts that you might want to, uh, then you might consider inputting into the system that will allow for an apple to appear? Yeah, that kind of, kind of relate, depends on your concept that you're trying to work with. Um, so for example, with my work, I wouldn't I wouldn't put such a literal keyword, okay. uh, so to speak. I would, so you um, wouldn't put emergency or uh, guerrilla, Chinese guerrilla fighters or communist I did, party? I okay. did. You did? And what <laughs> and, happened? Um, it's, it's not, not as very creative. As this. Yeah, it doesn't, okay. come out, like, it, it doesn't come out as, as well as I hoped for. Um, so yeah, the process of my work had, went through a lot of trials and error, really. Um, first starting with very simple language, and then later on it evolved into more of a poetic sort of uh, construction of sentences. Um, and, and I found that to work very well. Um, and interestingly, that changes the way I tell my personal story, I tell and further sort of expanded my, this family story into the larger Malaysia, Malaysian narrative. Um, so for example, I could show you an example here, especially this bit here, um, kind of hints at the migration story of the Chinese community into Malaya um, pre-independent Malaysia, Malaya, um, which li relates to how my, I imagine my ancestors to come um, sailing on a Chinese junk through stormy seas, landed into a place called Nanyang, um, old, the old name of Malaya. Um, so for that, if I were to put a, quite a literal sentence into the uh, model, right. I wouldn't get things like that. So. Um, just, I, it could allow me to sort of reveal the prom. So I was just talking to... <laughs> so I'm very curious because I couldn't... <laughs> I was just talking to Simon <laughs> about was, prompting. So when, when it comes to things like that, the prom is really the secret sauce to, ah. to, to these models. Okay, right? to um, make and, us, is it? Yeah, okay, the artist right. doesn't really want to reveal oh, the prompts. Okay. If you go online, they're quite cagey about it. And I found it quite interesting um, okay. because That's I really... Yeah, because I find that the democratization of these tools are meant to be quite open and I found it quite exciting. Um, but yeah, people are cagey about it. Um, but I don't mind revealing some of my prompts that I've used, especially that part with the C, and I will try and relate back to my process. Um, so the literal pro text prom was stunning scene of a Chinese junk sailboat wreckage on a sh rocky shoreline. That's a long sentence. It is a long sentence. And it works. Island with tall palm trees, okay. yeah, generations into distant future, hundreds of generations uh, into the past and hundreds of generations into the future. Illustrated in a symb symbolic and meaningful style by Liam Wong and Fu Baoshi. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, more, and then I can like add weight to the different elements that I want to see. So morning sunrise, morning sunrise is a different weight and photorealism, photorealism. And then the next frame, which creates the next frame of animation is, um, um, okay, let's talk about this scene then maybe. Uh, a magnificent painting depicting a peaceful Malayan Chinese village settlement at the fringe of the jungle in Malaya, 1940. Peaceful morning illustrated in the style of Liam Wong and Fu Baoshi, Singapore Nanyang style, 1950 to 1960, social realism, British path archive. So included in your prompts are also others that uh, you want the computer to approximate yes. their style, is yes. that right? Yes, approximate that... the style, and you could say it's sort of a remixing or mm. copying the style, um, but it's not really taking the artist style, it's just sort of interpreting the elements of what it thinks the artist style mm. is, and Kind of, kind of blend it in. Sometimes you might not even see that style in there. Um, so the Malayan New Village works pretty, uh, particularly well. Um, so how does that relate to my process then? Yeah, it changes the way I tell my story a little bit um, because I needed to write in that um, I could think poetically and mm -hmm. to construct sentences like that. Well, first I kind of construct poems first and then I sort of boil it down into a sentence structure that I sort of familiarize myself um, to working with. Um, yeah. So that was the technique. It's a lot of layers of thinking and, and, and messing about, really. 
No, but that, that, that's so exciting even for uh, a lot of us who maybe have not gone tr through that history, right? But at a personal level, what does all this mean to you? We've, we've looked at the more conceptual and technical aspect of how the images are conjured, and there is this other dimension of discussion that uh, we can all think about the, the macro dimension of it. But ultimately, this is also a very personal story. Uh, how has that process then shaped and inflect on your, how you understand your father? Yeah, my grandfather, yeah. yeah your grandfather, That's a good sorry. question, really. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's like the, um, it's just like the story of my grandfather's history and, the Malayan, and, and our, his involvement in the Malayan emergency was sort of inaccessible, inaccessible for us um, as a family as well as the Chinese community for a, for a long time. Um, maybe we don't want to talk about it because it's a taboo subject and, and the, the idea of the communist in Malaysia is still relatively quite controversial. And, and personally, we have a bit of shame. I feel that as a family that we had a grandfather who disappeared and, um, and became like ultra leftist, um, possibly engaged in very violent armed struggle. So, so like the tools, this practice sort of allow me, um, like I said, like using these kind of keywords to access this inaccessible um, archive, so mm -hmm. to speak. And uh, yeah, I find that quite exciting. It's like having a key to unlock these memories um, of, of the people that I interview and all the villagers that I, I went and around and interview, um, but also having the key to unlock this sort of huge nebulous database that's owned by nobody um, and at, at the same time I feel like and I'm reclaiming so, that and data reclaiming data. that because like this data set is very it's very colonial if you think about it right if you type in if you type in um, in the search engine a CEO idea of a CEO it will just give you like white man old white man or or, 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 or um, Asian women would give you like quite a horrible results. So it's still very kind of Western centric. And of course, it's all very based on English, the English language, right? So the mastery of the English language gives you access to these things. Um, and so I feel like, like telling a story that's quite niche um, within, you know, in, in the global context, in the global story, um, it's in a way like an, a small way of revolution, I think. <laughs> Did you put it in Chinese words? Or Malay words? Um, were, you, were you playing around with them? I did play with the Chinese word and translated Chinese words and I'm not sure that this is the thing with I'm not sure what I'm seeing, you know, like I don't know what the result has given me. Um, it does add something texturally um, interesting, but I don't know exactly what. Yeah. Um, any questions? Sure. Hi, Eddie. Um, I'm really interested uh, in your process because I mean I've dealt with uh, just very basic AI imagery on the web just for play, but I'm um, looking at your work. There is uh, certain aesthetics to it, which I'm wondering if you did anything in post. And the the second part is: is it intentional that you chose this form? Because when I'm looking at it, I think it's so apt that we're looking at an uh, image that's kind of trippy and you know it's merging and it goes so well with the idea of genealogical memory and stuff like that. So yeah, I, but the first question is really, um, is there a, a post process that you did to kind of treat the image? Because the aesthetics, the color especially, is re really gorgeous. It looks like it's been treated or is it, is it raw from the AI? Um, that's so it's a... Uh... Yeah, got, got makeup in that. <laughs> <laughs> Fix it in post. <laughs> um, that's a good question. There's no, there's no post production except upscaling. Um, so it's purely text generated, right? So if you want a Buddhist temple, I would ask for a Buddhist temple. And if I want an ancestral uh, altar, I would ask for an ancestral altar. Um, you could go quite specific or quite generic uh, with your description. Um, and um, yeah, if you want fog, if you want moody, foggy kind of scenario, you have to ask for it in a way. So the only post-production would be upscaling the, uh, the image into high resolution so it looks good in 4K. And you did put some prompts that kind of suggest a certain style of artwork, like social realism or a certain artist that kind of um, gave the... Because when you mentioned social realism just now earlier, 
there were some that looked like um, woodcut prints yes. as well. Yes, right. That was intentional as well to kind of. So I've learned a lot about art history doing this as well. <laughs> so it really taught me um, a lot of, of artists that I've not otherwise have known. Um, so, but I, I had very clear intentions of what art or what art styles that I want to use that relate to to the Malaysian emergency or the Malaysian history. Um, I think social realism and the Nanyang style was particularly, uh, it gave me quite a, a rich, rich result. Um, so yeah, the composition as well, it's all clearly prompted, you know, and uh, lighting and, so it's kind of like, like writing a script, you know. Uh, almost a screenplay. Almost a screenplay, which um, I foresee that's the way to, like it will happen in the future and uh, but I really highly recommend everyone to just try it now that you know some of the prompts uh, and the softwares are freely available. It is, it is freely uh, available. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's really something to just see how computers are able to translate some of the things that you're thinking about. Yeah, um, and more importantly, it, yeah. once you've kind of figured out how it kind of works and how it, you could master it, I think the most interesting part is the opposition of it, you know, right? Like, because if everyone has the tools, then what is the real value of it um, that you bring? to table and I like to think that it helps us shape our own culture, you know, helps us shape our own stories. Because um, it's quite easy to generate a lot of this glossy sci-fi mm -hmm. fantasy sort of look. That you can see tons of them online and you know as we speak right now, people are generating tons of these images. So it kind of forces us to rethink something and how do we um, adapt this AI into our life rather than being adapted to it, you know. That's a, that's a great note to end today's uh, artist conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Eddie Wong, and thank you to all the other artists. I don't know if everyone's here, but... Uh, I have a few more questions, I yes. think. That's what's, oh, are yeah. there more questions? Yes. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I was uh, just reminded to keep time, but I'm sure it's okay if we spill over a little bit. Great. Um, this one's a question of uh, terminology, because I noticed in the description over there you've spoken about a family rhizome. Uh, so why the choice of a rhizome versus the traditional notion of a family tree? Yeah, it's a really good question. I was really interested in um, it's because the rhizome is almost like an anti genealogy, right? It's like I, I, I'm interested. I'm not interested. Well, the family tree was a starting point, and then I realized that the, what my grandfather's story was unique, but not uncommon among the Mal in Malaysian history. And I endeavored to find the related, um, the related elements and people and stories that are related to, to my family. Um, so the, the idea of the rhizome, the idea of a root going sideways was, uh, was sort of a starting point for me to think wider. Um, from a micro to the macro perspective of this history. Um, and what else do I want to say about that? Yeah, because like, um, the, the work isn't really about tracing, tracing my family tree to find my origins or my roots. It's really a map, you know, it's like a mapping uh, which has different entranceway um, and hence the fragmentation of this story. And I could kind of access it in a different way and eventually I hope to find to get out of the family thing and you know and see the bigger picture if that <laughs> in, a sim in a simplistic way yeah uh, do you have a question yeah, go ahead uh, so like has your family seen your work especially your grandma if she's still around and uh, has it helped to like you know open the conversation no that's yeah oh okay sorry yeah <laughs> yeah has it helped to like open the the conversation talk about like the collective family trauma Grandma, you understand or not? <laughs> it's a very good question. So that's my mom, actually. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you can blame her for telling me these stories. <laughs> like, like she's been feeding me a lot of these stories that otherwise I wouldn't have known um, because she spoke with my father, uh, who's no longer here, and also her, his mother. So, she, so that kind of relates to Dipali's work of gossiping, right? When women like they sit together in a family, they start telling about family stories, and it's that sort of so-called gossip, so-called um, conversation sort of flow into, flow into these things. Um, how do we open up the family trauma? Uh, it's, it was difficult and also, I, I don't know if it's particularly emotionally difficult, but it's more like ambivalent of people. Of the, oh yeah, you know, grandfather went into jungle. It, it is what it is. Um, 
we are better now. We are better off now. But you know, something in me couldn't let that go so easily. You know, um, I think it's just our way of just brushing things, these kind of historical moments away, which I felt it was a shame. Um, but in doing this, like, thanks for asking this question. Um, it kind of opened up even more a can of worms <laughs> in my family, and I realized that it's like there's so much that entangled in the British colonial um, system. Um, more so, more than just my grandfather entering the jungle as a communist, like. And I, I found out that my father was put in a juvenile detention center in um, the Gurney um, Boys School as well um, for stealing rubber as a teenager. And, and that kind of shaped his life, right? Because he learned these sort of vocational skills in this school, which sort of brought us up, you know, he, he learned that skill. So it kind of like complicates the idea of like the, the colonial benevolence and also the, you know, are they really kind to the people? Or do they really want just extract labor again uh, and want us to like, you know, just to build a workforce in, in the empire? Um, yeah, and then there are a lot of stories about how, you know, we work as mates as well. At, at, like um, these bankers who set up, set up shop in Malaysia, like HSBC, people like that. Um, you know, my mom was a housekeeper there as well. So it sort of opened up a lot of these stories and I realized it's very tightly woven um, to the fabric of um, Malaysian history. But in principally centering them as the protagonists of your stories, it yeah, almost like seems like you're giving, you're recognizing their agency, right? Yeah. In spite of the, like, yeah, in spite of this labyrinthine sort of like system of colonialism of, yeah. uh, that we're all, you know, embedded within, We're embedded within. there yeah. is that human that's trying to make ends meet and make something better out of, uh, you of know, life, yeah, yeah. out of life. Yeah, so. which gives us like the, the community here quite a distinctive flavor, right? The Chinese here um, sort of stick a claim into our personhood um, in Malaysia, which is quite contentious still sometimes, you know, or used or yeah, be manipulated anyway. Yeah. Great. Uh, all right, thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today.